list of places and go to see a rental agent to check on a number of points. Listen to the conversation between your friend and the rental agent and complete the list. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Hi, we've been looking over your listing of apartments for rent and we have a few questions about a couple of the apartments. Can you help us? Sure. Yep, yeah, this is our most recent listing. What would you like to know? Well, we were first wondering about the house on 3rd Street. We can see that it is furnished and rents for $135 a week, but can you tell us how many bedrooms it has? Let's see. In addition to the den, it has three bedrooms. The rental on 3rd Street has three bedrooms. So in the example, three bedrooms has been written down in the number of rooms column for 19 3rd Street. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hi, we've been looking over your listing of apartments for rent, and we have a few questions about a couple of the apartments. Can you help us? Sure. Yep, yeah, this is our most recent listing. What would you like to know? Well, we were first wondering about the house on 3rd Street. We can see that it is furnished and rents for $135 a week, but can you tell us how many bedrooms it has? Let's see. In addition to the den, it has three bedrooms. What about the one on Route 9N? It looks like it's big with a library and a deck, but it doesn't say how much it costs or anything else about it. Oh yes, Mrs Gaylor's apartment. That one is actually only a 10-month rental and it is going for $156 per week. It's quite a nice place. She only rents for 10 months each year because of horse racing season. Then her relatives all come to stay, so tenants have to move out. It's a little bit inconvenient, but past tenants have really enjoyed their stay there. Oh, well, we need it for a full year. I guess that one is out. How about the rental on Broen Drive? How many rooms does that one have? As it says on the list, it has two bedrooms and a private kitchen and bath. But it's actually a very small place. That's why it's a bit cheaper. Oh. Well then, what about the one that has three large rooms? Who is renting that property? That one is a good deal. Mr John Smith is renting it. But he's quite eccentric and he has a strict rule about no pets. How about cats? Nope. Absolutely no pets. Hmm. Well then, how about this studio apartment rented by Mr Bo Jensen? How is that one? That ad is actually a bit deceptive. The studio apartment is the whole upper floor of an older house. It's actually very large and, at $45 a week, quite affordable. And it's near campus. I think I'd like to check that one out. Do you have a telephone number that we can call? It's not on the list? Oh, it isn't. Here it is. You should ring area code 518 and then 543-7790. Thanks. I think I'll call on that one first. Your friend decides that he would like to talk to Mr. Bo Jensen. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Hello, 1512, Route 9. 
Yes. Is this Mr. Jensen? Yes, it is. Can I help you? Yeah, we're studying here at university, and we came across the rental information for the studio apartment that you are renting. Is it still available? Yes, of course. I actually just placed the ad, and you're the first person to call. Is there anything you'd like to know about it? Yes, actually, there is. As students, we are on the internet a lot, and we heard that some homes in the area have high-speed connections. What type of connection do you have there now? Oh, <laughs> that's an interesting first question, but I guess I have heard that too. But we just have a phone line here, nothing fancy. I think you can have a cable line installed, but it's just a phone line for now. Okay, well maybe we can do that. What type of heating does the apartment have? Now there's a more traditional question. We have oil heat here. It's an older house. That tends to be a little more expensive during the winter, right? Yeah, but there's nothing to do about it. It would cost too much for me to put in a gas heater. What else would you like to know about the apartment? Well, we heard it was quite big. Is it furnished? Actually, yes. I should have put that in the ad. It has an old couch and a couple chairs, a dining table, refrigerator, stove, and even a dishwasher. Does it have any beds? Yep, it has two. That sounds great. When is the apartment available? You can have it tomorrow night if you want. I just have to clean up a couple things before you get here. Do you want to come over and see it first? No, it sounds fine to us. I actually know the street too, so I know the area. We'll take it. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear an extract from a talk about employment interviews. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Today I have with me Sandy Richardson of the local Workforce Center, and she'll be talking about that critical step towards the goal of employment, the interview. Sandy, what is an interview for, and what's the best way to approach it? A job interview is simply a meeting between you and a potential employer to discuss your qualifications and see if there is a fit. The employer wants to verify what they know about you and talk about your qualifications. If you have been called for an interview, you can assume that the employer is interested in you. The employer has a need that you may be able to meet, so it's your goal to identify that need and convince the employer that you're the one for the job. As everyone knows, interviews can be stressful, but when you're well prepared, there's no reason to panic. Preparation is the key to success in a job search, and you can begin by collecting together all the documents you may need for the interview, such as extra copies of your resume, lists of references, and letters of recommendation. You could also take some work samples, selecting from what you have designed, drawn, or written, for instance. And make sure you have a pen and pad of paper for taking notes. The next step is to find out about the post. The more you know about the job, the employer, and the industry, the better prepared you will be to target your qualifications. Always request a job description from the employer and research employer profiles at the Chamber of Commerce or local library. 
You could also try to network with people who work for the company or with employees of companies associated with it. The next step is to match your qualifications to the requirements of the job. A good approach is to write out your qualifications along with the job requirements. Think about some standard interview questions and how you might respond. Most questions are designed to find out more about you, your qualifications, or to test your reactions in a given situation. If you don't have any experience or skills in a required area, think about how you might compensate for those deficiencies. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. During an interview, it's important that you be yourself. Get a good night's sleep and plan your travel to be there in plenty of time so that you're not arriving out of breath with 30 seconds to spare. Don't, though, present yourself for the interview too early, 10 minutes at most. In the interview, listen carefully to each question asked. Take your time in responding and make sure your answers are positive. It's important to express a good attitude and show that you're willing to work, eager to learn, and are flexible. If you are unsure of a question, don't be afraid to ask for clarification. In fact, it's sometimes a good strategy to close a response with a question for the interviewer. In general, focus on your qualifications and look for opportunities to personalize the interview. Briefly answer questions with examples of how you responded in comparable situations from either your life or previous job experiences. Something you should avoid are yes or no responses to questions, but don't dwell too long on non-job related topics. Use caution if you are questioned about your salary requirements. The best strategy is to avoid the question until you have been offered a job. Questions about salary asked before there is a job offer are usually screening questions that may eliminate you from consideration, so be warned. On the other hand, it isn't inappropriate to show your enthusiasm if your first impressions of the interview and of the employer are good ones. So, if the job sounds like what you are looking for, say so. Keep in mind that the interview is not over when you are asked if you have any questions. Come prepared to ask a couple of specific questions that, again, show your knowledge and interest in the job. Close the interview in the same friendly, positive manner in which you started. When the interview is over, leave promptly. Don't overstay your time. Think about the interview and learn from the experience. Evaluate the success and failures. The more you learn from the interview, the easier the next one will become you'll become much more confident. To close, here are a few more tips. First, maintain good eye contact throughout the interview and be aware of nonverbal body language. Second, dress a step above what you would wear on the job. Go to the hairdressers, have a shave, etc. Remember that your appearance is a key indicator of whether you have the right attitude, so it can pay to give some thought to how you look. And finally, don't be a clock watcher. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three.
You are going to hear a conversation between an interviewer and a professor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 21 to 26. Today I'm here with Professor Nitik, who is our new university president. He has been a professor for 20 years and teaches many of the best classes on campus. I know many of you have had him as a teacher and know of his brilliance. Good morning, Professor Nitik. Thank you for stopping by the student station. Thank you for having me here. It is always great to get to meet many of the students who are involved with our school. I haven't been here since two years ago. Yes, I remember at that time you were still teaching every semester. Two years later, you are only teaching every once in a while. But it seems like you are still always busy. The administration world is just as busy as the teaching world for you. How do you stay in touch with the university, even with the change in your everyday duties? I try to stay in touch with what is popular with the university students. I usually spend time with as many students as I can. They usually give me insight into what the new concerns and beliefs are for the new generation. On top of that, I try to be as youthful as I can. I consider myself to be youthful, at least for my age. So I always have a good time and try to stay young. I try my best to not just be a teacher, but also participate in university life. Interesting. So, are you still doing lots of academic work, or are you mostly concentrating on administrative affairs? Well, I mostly do administrative affairs now, but that doesn't mean that I still don't have a very deep interest in academic matters. I often visit other campuses around the world and meet other professors in my field. I learn the most by travelling and seeing the different places of the world and the different fields of thought. I even did a television programme last month in Manchester. Will you be on television any time soon, then? Well, you can call the television station and see if I will be on television any time soon. Maybe I will be on the news report. I don't think it is really that significant, though. Oh, really? That sounds great. I will remember to look out for you. Let's move on. With all your busy travelling recently, how do you find time for your personal life? I try to keep my university life separate from my personal life. Sometimes it's hard to find time to just take my wife and three kids out for a family dinner, but usually we all manage to get together every few days. I'm taking a few weeks off next month to take my family down to South America, to Brazil for a few days. I can't wait to just sit on the beach. Wow, that sounds like a wonderful trip. Professor Nitik, could you tell the audience a little about what goes on in an average day of a university administrator? <laughs> An average day? Oh, I don't think there is such thing as an average day for me. The last few weeks I've been travelling all the time. I can be in Los Angeles in the morning and in New York by the afternoon and back to Los Angeles by the evening. Sometimes I will spend the whole week at a new university, showing the new administrators the ins and outs of running a university. Sometimes I can spend the whole day in the office on the phone. So there really is no average day for me. I guess that is because I do so many different tasks. Sorry to let all the viewers down, but that is the plain truth. Now look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 27 to 30. Well, I guess I can sum it up for them. You are a busy man. That is probably a good description. So, are there any immediate plans for the coming few weeks? 
Well, I'm in Los Angeles for the next two days, and then I fly to Colorado to meet a new prospective professor for our university. I will be in Colorado for about a week. Then I go to Japan for the next ten days to meet with our university branch in Japan about record sales there. After that, I return to Los Angeles for a week, just in time for the graduation of the class of two thousand and one. There you have it, my next month's schedule. Thank you very much, Professor Nitik. I always enjoy having you on our show. We hope to have you back on our show next time. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. Now listen to the second part of the lecture. As you listen, complete the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Many typically American characteristics: individualism, self-reliance, informality, punctuality, and directness are a result of those values mentioned earlier. Other national traits could also be identified, however. One, Americans cooperate. Although often competitive, Americans also have a good sense of teamwork and cooperate with others to achieve a goal. Two. Americans are friendly, but in their own way. In general, friendships among Americans tend to be shorter and more casual than friendships among people from other cultures. This has something to do with American mobility. And the fact that Americans do not like to be dependent on other people, Americans also tend to compartmentalize friendships, having friends at work, family friends, friends on the softball team, etc. Three, Americans ask a lot of questions, some of which may to you seem pointless, uninformed, or elementary. Someone you have just met may ask you very personal questions. No impertinence is intended. The questions usually grow out of a genuine interest. Four, Americans tend to be internationally naive. Many Americans are not very knowledgeable about international geography or world affairs. They may ask uninformed questions about current events and may display ignorance of world geography. Because the U.S. is not surrounded by many other nations. Some Americans tend to ignore the world. Five. Silence makes Americans nervous. Americans are not comfortable with silence. They would rather talk about the weather than deal with silence in a conversation. Six. Americans are open and usually eager to explain. If you do not understand certain behavior or want to know what makes Americans tick. Do not hesitate to ask questions. Just as values and traits differ somewhat from one culture to another, 
so do the personal habits associated with good manners and courtesy. While very often there does not seem to be any particular reason why a particular way of doing something is considered good manners, observing these cultural rules will make Americans more comfortable with you, and therefore you with them. It is, of course, impossible to cover all the possibilities here. If you are unsure in a situation, just ask. Americans like to be helpful. 1. Queuing up or lining up is essential. Courtesy requires that you do not push from behind, stand next to the person being helped, or cut into a line. If you should accidentally bump someone, you should say, Excuse me. 2. Americans blow their noses into a tissue. Spitting, clearing phlegm, or sniffing as from a cold are considered rude. 3. It is considered poor manners to slurp, chew noisily, or open your mouth while chewing. 4. Questions are seen as a good way of getting acquainted, but questions about a person's age, financial affairs, cost of clothing or personal belongings, religious affiliations and sex life are considered too personal for questioning, except between very close friends. 5. Men generally do not hold hands or link arms in public with other men. This is somewhat more acceptable between women and quite common between men and women. Now, a few words about personal safety. Unfortunately, in the US, one must be aware of crimes. It is wise to be especially careful until you are familiar with the community in which you live. Remember that good judgment and common sense can significantly reduce chances of having an unpleasant and perhaps harmful experience. Basic safety rules include the following. 1. Do not walk alone at night. 2. When you leave your room, apartment or automobile, make sure that all doors are locked and all windows are secured. 3. Do not carry too much cash or wear jewellery of great value. 4. Never accept a ride from a stranger. Do not hitchhike and do not pick up hitchhikers. 5. Be careful of purses and wallets, especially in crowded metropolitan areas where there may be purse snatchers and pickpockets. 6. If a robber threatens you, at home or on the street, Try not to resist unless you feel that your life is in danger and you must fight or run away. Give up your valuables as calmly as you can and observe as much as possible about the robber to tell the police when you report the crime. A final note. Keep an open mind. Don't judge what you see as right or wrong, but make it a challenge to try to understand the variety of American behaviours which you may observe. You certainly do not have to participate in something you disagree with, but you can try to understand it. This will help you build an attitude of intelligent and liberated respect for cultures, both your own and others. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.